tell us more about Golan tips and tricks. Uh, so Florin, over to you. Hey everyone, thank you for having me uh, today. Let me see if I can share the screen first and let's see some Golan tips and tricks. Cool. I'll stop sharing now so you can take over. Perfect, cool. So hopefully now you should be able to see my screen. Yes. Okay, perfect. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Florian. I work for JetBrains as a developer advocate and I usually talk about Goland and uh, everything Go related. So Goland is our uh, Go dedicated IDE based on the IntelliJ platform. And tonight I'm gonna show you some tips and tricks. So no matter if you're just starting with the IDE or you're using it for a while or you're using any of our other products, you should be able to uh, use them. There will be some Go specific uh, tips and tricks as well. So stay tuned. And if you have any questions, please do ask them and I'll try to address them either at the end of the presentation or I'll try to either send you tweets or reply to you by email or we'll find a way to, to sort them out. Cool, so uh, first of all, this is my ID. I'm running the latest 2020.1.2 uh, release and um, I don't really usually keep it like this because even though you may see that I don't have any tabs or any other windows, uh, I also prefer to focus on my code. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is actually um, get into the uh, Zen mode as we call it. And this will allow me to actually focus on the code and so on. Cool, so once this is done, you'll see that I don't have the file view anymore. And one thing that I can actually do to uh, bring it back would be to use the navigation bar, which allows me to quickly jump in the project wherever I need. And let's start with the completion tips and tricks. So as you can see, I've sorted these out by folders, by types and so on. And I, at the end, I'll also share the presentation uh, repository in case you want to try some of these on your own and follow the presentation along. So the first one uh, would be something simple, uh, but yeah, we start with something simple and then we continue to more complex ones. As you can see, completion works. It doesn't really need to import uh, the FMT package or the log package or anything like that. And I don't even need to type the correct function name for that to work. So I'm gonna have something like this and bam, our first tip is completed. Let's go to something a bit more advanced here. So. If I go to this function and for example, I want to complete uh, the handler here. Well, I could just invoke the completion as normal, or I could call something that's called the uh, smart type completion, which will narrow down the types that we see inside the function uh, in this case. What I can choose now is a specific uh, types uh, or symbols that match my uh, underlying type. In this case, I can use directly not found, or I can create the Lambda function for uh, the handler. So let's create the Lambda function, for example. And that's it. Another tip that we have for completion, if you are using it, uh, would be uh, having a postfix completion. And these are a bit similar to the regular completion, but what you can do with them is basically type a dot at the end of a symbol or an expression and get a list of other completion options. So normally you don't have anything, but the idea allows you to further uh, use code templates to actually get some uh, completion out of it. And in this particular case, I'm gonna use the var uh, postfix completion to define our variables. So for example, message, and it inferred correctly that this is an error, so I'm gonna get error. With these, you can customize them and you can also uh, use your own postfix completions. And there's a, a different topic about that that you can find on our blog. Further, um, there is a cool completion which is a bit hidden, but it can help you whenever you have a specific type that you want to complete using our uh, completion engine. So you can press uh, control space once to get the postfix completion. But if you press control space twice or control space space, you'll get a list of all the functions and methods that allow you to uh, have the first parameter, the type 
of the variable that you're completing in this case. So the type would be string. And what I can do now, I can start uh, just typing, for example, to title. And it's going to import automatically both the package and put the correct function name in place and so on. So this is useful if you want to discover functions which accept uh, the first parameter type that you have under the cursor. Moving forward, we have uh, something that uh, is similar to postfix completions, but they are called live templates. And what you can do with these live templates is that you can define them. And I'm going to show you the ID settings. And for live templates, uh, for example, here in the Go section, you are able to see a, uh, a few of them. We ship quite a few out of the box, but I also added um, some custom ones like the database data source. And this is because I never remember how to correctly type in this. Um, this string to connect to a database. So in my case, if I just start typing dbds, just like a regular item that I would want to have completion for, I'll get both the description. And when I press enter, I can then start customizing the parameters for this. So it would allow me to select the username, password, the host port, and whatever else I put it as a customization. It's not a live uh, template per se, but in the spirit of completion, you can also use the if value different from nil. And in this case, I'm going to use the error because usually that's where we spend most of the time, right? Another thing that we can do with completion, and this is uh, quite a new one, but I particularly like it. It's the fact that when you uh, type a uh, comma after the parameter uh, return type, you will get automatically added the parentheses. So that should make things easier to uh, refactor and add uh, parameters if you do this manually. And if you're used to something like go returns, you'll be able to see that we also offer completion for uh, values on return. So for example, in this case, we can choose to return a type here and we can say something like error, let's say new and some error here. Cool. So moving forward, we have uh, something that's called partial ma match completion. And I'm not really sure if you've noticed me doing this so far. So let's see what it's about. We can type, as the uh, slide says, something like read, uh, write, and then closer. And the ID will automatically complete this for us and import the package. So we can just continue moving forward. So. If you remember how the name is written, then you can actually go back and like quickly type it without having to type the full identifier name. Let's go with the uh, completion items here. So for example, here, I don't have um, a need for printf. So what would I do? Usually I could say, well, print and then line. And because I did that, if I press enter, it would generate me an error, right? But what you can do is invoke completion and then you can press tab and it's gonna replace the identifier to the right. And that's it. Like we don't have to uh, adjust for the broken code anymore. Let's move forward. Second to last item in the completion section. So as you can see, here we have an error. So I can quickly jump with the uh, high, next highlight there. And then here I can uh, start invoking the completion to have a uh, completion for my interface add. And this allows us to do completion for items in the assertion uh, cases like this for interfaces. And Roland automatically knows that, well, my typing uh, actually implements the IO reader interface. And that means that I can uh, safely assert it here. And our last item in the completion uh, section. Uh, let's say that we uh, want to type function names and that's fine, but we then switch back to parameter names and uh, parameter types and so on. And that's usually a bit tricky. 
to to find a name or to like you don't necessarily want to to give it a, a name because you're not sure uh goland can infer the name of parameters based on the name of uh the type that you're uh, writing so if we say something like response uh writer here goland will uh, see that hey this is an http response writer so you probably want to name this w because that's the convention and then if I want to say, I want to have a request here, uh, Goland will again suggest HTTP request. Uh, and this time around we'll suggest R. And as you can see for RPC request, it's gonna suggest a different name. So let's see this in action here. If I say request here, uh, I can add a second parameter or I can add the request uh, as well. And this is the uh, last item in the completion section. Let's uh, move to the next uh, section to editing tips. Uh, let's say you want to select something quickly. Like normally you'd reach out for the mouse and be like, okay, I need to wait. I need, I'm not really sure how to do this, how to do that, right? So I'm gonna show that. And I'm gonna show you how to use cyclic expand word as well, because maybe you don't really want to go here and start clicking and so on. So first selection, you can use the expand selection, right? And then copy, paste, and like, that's not efficient. But if I know the identifier name above, I can go quickly here and I can say something like slash. Okay, alt slash and cyclic expand word, figure out that I need to use the word from above. Uh, similarly, if I undo and I press the, uh, other shortcut for uh, expand word but backward, I can cycle through words that I have defined below me. So this should allow me to quickly complete everything from, from the code below. Let's move forward. So uh, parameters uh, for functions usually, especially if you don't necessarily know the package name and the function name and so on are useful and you can invoke them with parameter information. But this also works with uh, structures. So whenever you define a, a variable of type structure or where you initialize a structure, better said, you are able to see the uh, parameter information, which in this case would be fields of the structure. And not only that, but for example, it works in uh, substructures as well, in, or better said, embedded structures like in this example here. Moving forward with our editing tips, what we have here is the uh, completion that works inside strings. So let's say, for example, you want to write a JSON. Now, the normal way to write JSON or the standard way would be you write this and then you start writing this and then you're like, okay, I need to escape this and that. So that's not gonna be really quick to do. You can use row strings as well. So like if I change this one here, well, now I don't need to escape, but it's still not the really convenient. So what can I do here? Well, I can say inject language and I can say JSON. So whenever I say that, you'll see a message that JSON was temporarily injected. And then you can say, okay, uh, edit JSON fragment. And then you'll start typing in your like status and then 200 and you get JSON validation as well. So. For example, in this case, I can see that there's an error here and yeah, perhaps I should uh, fix that. Okay, and then you can close this at the end whenever you're finished. This would be like a regular tab if you use tabs, but I personally don't. Uh, completion works also in uh, strings. For example, the long type that you, you see here, it's actually useful for a go template completion. So you can do something like this and then you get completion for uh, types inside uh, a go template, which could be helpful, for example, uh, if you're writing any anything that uses go templates. Okay, let's move forward with our next tip. So, Let's say that we want to define a JSON, right? So first of all, well, I should create the structure here, right? And if you 
you give me one minute, I will be able to invoke the create type uh, here. And this will automatically infer that this is a structure. And then I can say, well, create the missing fields as well and navigate to the uh, undefined fields using next highlight there. But then I probably need to add a JSON as well uh, because I'm marshalling this into a JSON. So I can turn this into the column selection mode and I can just start typing JSON. And this is gonna add the JSON tag for me. And then I can continue with whatever else I need to do uh, in, in the structure tags. Cool. So almost ready with the editing tips as well. So I was mentioning earlier that you don't necessarily need to, uh, to reach out for the mouse to select. You can uh, select things with the extent selection. So this allows you to select semantically anything on your screen and then you are able to also contract the selection. So in case, for example, you select something like this here and you're like, okay, actually I need something uh, a bit narrower, I can do that. And this works very well, for example, for fields and so on here. So, and speaking of selection, you should probably want to use a selection too quickly, select everything in the file or parts of it that match your identifier, for example, or anything that's really text. So I will say add selection for the next occurrence and select everything that's uh, below the cursor or I can undo that. And there are shortcuts for um, skipping a selection or going above in, in, uh, bef before the cursor. Okay, our other tip. So for example, let's say that uh, you have completion, right? And well, you define a uh, comment here and you can say, okay, uh, add a comment, perfect. And then, does, and then you want to refer something else like the demo type, right? So you can invoke completion here and that's it, it works. Right, so this is our uh, completion. I'll skip the modules part for now because that's gonna be a bit time consuming and I'll try to come back to it at the end. So uh, if you're referring, referring any uh, file in your comments, you probably also want to quickly jump between them right, like I'm doing here. One way to do this is to actually make the selection and then invoke the uh, navigate to file. And then there you can uh, invoke the quick definition. And sorry, this is what happens when you change resolutions. Um, you can preview the definition here of the file. So you don't really have to open it, but let's say we open the file, right? I don't have any tabs anymore. So what should I do? Because I also don't have a file view. Well, we can go back using the uh, recent files, right? And this will show me a list of all the recent files I've been to, selecting the uh, previous files as uh, the, the last one. And I can press enter and that's it. I can also use the switcher to switch back to the file quickly. So this will allow me to jump between files quickly. Or I can use the recent edited locations to allow me to quickly uh, have a preview of the locations my cursor was. So in this case, I can see that, yeah, I've been playing around in a lot of main Go files. And here, for example, I can select add to field and everything that's uh, add to field related will show up here. Cool, so let's go back and let's move on to the next navigation tip. Again, with uh, navigating to, to our file, um, let's say that we, we want to navigate to, to this file and say, well, we want to invoke the structure, right? So if I press the uh, structure, I can see quickly the file without having to perform any other operations in it. And I can see all the components in, better said, all the definitions in, in that file. But not only that, if I press the same shortcut again, I will then be able to see everything in that package. So in the package of the file that I'm looking at. And that is useful for a number of cases, especially when you're exploring a code base. Okay, so let's, uh, let's switch back. And the last thing that we can do is that we can invoke the select in because, well, we probably want to actually see the where the file is. 
And we can either choose to uh, view this in the project view, in the file uh, structure, in our uh, operating system file browser, or in the web browser. But, but in this case, I want to see it in the project view. And this is where I am right now. Cool. So moving forward, our last navigation tip here. So let's say you're reading the source code and you're like, okay, so where is my read function called here? If I press the correct shortcut for it, I can see the call hierarchy for it. And as you can see, it's pretty instant. And it allows you to locate all the instances of the read uh, function calls. And this is where uh, my type is. Uh, currently invoked as well, and I defined it earlier, you've seen it in the demo. But what happens, for example, if I want to see the uh, call hierarchy for uh, the you know, type hierarchy and so on? So uh, let's say I want to switch back to this one, and I will say something like uh, call hierarchy for the read function here. And then I will uh, will see that as well. So now I can browse and descend into all the uh, functions that I called and so on. So that should be pretty useful as well. Moving on from the navigation tips to the refactoring tips. So if you're writing code and you probably uh, are using interfaces as well, you reach out to a point where you're like, okay, I need to implement an interface. So what you can do here is you can say, I want to implement the methods of an interface. And I also want to create a type because I don't have any defined in the current file. And let's say I'm gonna implement the read uh, write closer interface because well, I don't have the imagination. Uh, and my type here. And now my interface is implemented. I can link the parameters for it and so on. And you can see that we are implementing the interface because I can navigate back to the interface now. Cool, moving forward with our refactoring tips. So let's say I want to uh, change the signature of the app numbers. And well, maybe I'm in the uh, call place, right? So I'm here, not on the definition place. And I can say, well, change signature, and then I can shuffle the parameters around or I can choose to add a error as a return type. I don't know why I would want that, but let's just say. Cool, so once this is done, maybe I also want to move this to a different package. So what, I can, what can I do now is I can say, invoke the same um, shortcut and say move, and then I will, yeah, I'll use this file and this package and I'm gonna refactor. But the idea will prevent me because I cannot call a unexported uh, identifier from a different package. So it's gonna tell me that. Well, it will still allow me to do that if I really, really want to. But if I don't, I can go here, click on the exported and refactor and it's gonna be happy. So now it's gonna complain, hey, like the name starts with the package name, are you really sure? Yeah, I'm not really sure. I probably should name this a bit better so I can just call it numbers. And if I don't press enter a couple of times, <laughs> that would be awesome. So now I can go back, like add comments and so on. And I also can go back to my file and navigate to the usage place. And I can see that the ID also imported the correct uh, path for my uh, uh, module and my file. Moving forward, and I know we are getting close to the end. So we have the uh, ability to uh, use interfaces, as I said earlier, but we can also extract an interface from, from a type. So in this case, I can invoke the same refactor this uh, feature and say extract interface. And this will allow me to extract the, an interface based on the, on the type that I have here. And let's say I want to extract it based on the, uh, this type, I want to call it uh, demo, and then let's say main, refactor and that's it. So I can quickly create interfaces based on that. And our final tip from the refactoring, well, let, let's say that I have a string that, that string into a constant in this case, 
And I can choose to either replace only a single occurrence or all the occurrences of that string. And let's say I call it this message. But if I want to undo that, I can either hit the undo button or if I'm a bit later on, I can say inline and I'm gonna inline that value. And that's it uh, from the refactoring. The last and the least, we run debug and uh, test tips and tricks. So let's let's say here that we have a breakpoint, right? And I can choose to set the breakpoint with a control F8. It's fine, but I can also choose to have conditions for this breakpoint. So I can say if error is not nil, then stop. Otherwise, continue and don't uh, stop the application. And then when I actually choose to run the uh, under the debugger and we'll wait for the gopher to compile. Oh my, so we have an error. It actually stopped when the error happened and we didn't need to do anything special for it. So we only stopped when the execution uh, actually matches the uh, condition, which is great. Moving on. So from the uh, here, like I don't have enough time to write the test, right? So let's try uh, the refactoring. Well, there's nothing there. What can I do? Well, I can choose to generate as we did previously for the, our interface. And I can say uh, test for the file uh, or test for the function and test for the package as well. And you can quickly write the test here and you'd be able to say, oh, I want this and I probably want to give it a name. I want the test uh, name to be one. I want, well, fields, let's say, I'm gonna say uh, message. And then what should I do? Uh, let's say I have arguments and I have one here and then, I don't know, let's say I want an integer and I want one. And probably field one is not correct because if, if we see the error here, I can't really use that as a string. So let's change this a bit. So what do I do now? Well, I can run this uh, using cover. And what will happen is that my test will now run. I will get the coverage profile for this. And when that happens, I can go back to the main file and I can see that, yes, I'm actually uh, getting coverage for that. So if I go back to the uh, test itself, here, I can uh, also say, well, toggle the auto test, which in my case, it's enabled. And make sure that, for example, here, we set the delay to one second, because I want to do that. And let's validate that, you know, the test is actually live and we're... If you notice this, I have not saved throughout the whole presentation, any, any file and everything just worked. Yes, my test will fail. So, Let's close this and let's make sure that, you know, we don't have any coverage displayed and that's it. Speaking of save, you should be able to see a save all if I ever press the save key, which I am not. Cool, so other thing here, um, let's say I'm running this in the debugger, right? So this is an application which looks like a server. Maybe it's your classic HTTP server, which does some things and so on. And it stopped because I put a breakpoint. Now, this is a feature that we uh, introduced recently and it allows you to tag Go routines so that you can use them. It relies on the runtime people of uh, support for labels. And what it does is it actually allows you to make a bit more meaningful Go routines in the debugger rather than just having to look at random Go routine names. So I can see that, for example, this one is stopped in the login uh, point, even if it's in runtime park otherwise. Cool, so how would it look like without the tags? Well, I can go to the edit configurations. And if I would remove the debugger from here, I would be able to say debug again. And let's wait for the gopher to compile. And this is how it would look like without naming go routines. So, if you want to debug and you're using Goland, you can actually go uh, name your Go routines. There's a blog post about that that you can read and you'll be able to uh, 
add labels to your uh, debugging. Cool. Let's go. We have the last two of them here. So let's go here. I feel that this will make me jump to the test file. So perfect. Let's say you are writing benchmarks, which are important for your workflow and your application needs them. You can run, run benchmarks using our CPU profiler, memory profiler, blocking profiler, and so on. And by our, I mean the PPROF profiler, of course. And this will display the results in uh, inside the ID. It's gonna use flame graphs. So if you're familiar with those, you can actually see uh, your favorite flame graphs here. But if you don't particularly like them, as I am, I don't, for example, you can still uh, still see the call tree or you can see uh, the method list and see, if, for example, what took the longest CPU time or what's the own CPU time and so on. Right, and the final one, I'm not gonna show all the uh, profiles from here. So let's say that we are debugging and well, it's a debug tips and tricks. So it's a lot of debugging in, in place. And we got here to a place where we have a function chain call, right? Now, if I would press step in two, I would step into make demo and then into greet, but I don't want that. So I can invoke the smart step in two. And this would allow me to actually choose where I want to step. I can say, yes, I want to step into make demo or I want to step into greet because I don't want to uh, see anything related to make demo. And I'm gonna do that. And another feature that I'm showing to you right now is the fact that whenever you have a simple enough debug string string uh, or string method uh, that's returning a string, you can actually uh, have some magic in the debugger and it will uh, show you a value that, that you're returning here. It has to be relatively simple because the ID is actually evaluating that method. So we don't use the function called support from Delft and uh, it's gonna display the value here. And I think that is it because I am running out of time. Uh, if there are a couple of questions, maybe we can take them. If not, that would be it. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, I think there are a few questions in the webinar chat. If you want to take a look, uh, sure. Let me let me see in the chat. You say, yeah. Okay. Give me one second. And sorry to make this uh, so quick. I know we are in a bit of a limited time. There's going to be a webinar in the beginning of June where I'm going to go this at a bit of a slower pace. And if you want to attend search on our uh, blog and it's going to be fine. Let me quickly have a look here. So uh, yes, so the repository for the tips and tricks actually, let me say open on GitHub. And this one will bring the GitHub repository. I'm going to put this here while I'm reading the uh, a couple of other questions. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me see. Let me see. So, chat. Okay. So, uh, does uh, Goland integrate with Goland C? Uh, we have a tool which allows you to run external tools. So uh, Golang uh, CA would be one of those that you can configure. Uh, it's called the file watchers. You will not get the same experience as we, you get for inspections. So for example, uh, you will not be able to see any of the assistance and any of the uh, messages in line and so on, um, but you can still use it if you want. Uh, the results will be shown in a separate window. You can configure that using the uh, tools, external tools, and then you can say, uh, uh, sorry, file watchers. And then you can say plus, and then you're like, okay, I want Golang CA Mint, which is predefined. Uh, if you don't have it, it's gonna ask you to install it. And if you have it, it's gonna show the configuration. And by default, uh, we uh, just disable one of these uh, checks, but you can customize it and so on. Uh, 
I don't have it installed, so sorry, I can I can't really show it to you here. Um, okay. Um, I if you don't mind, I will address some of the others uh, in private. So well, I'm gonna yield my time to to the others. Uh, speaking tonight. So thank you once again for having me here tonight. Uh, thanks for watching. I know there's a lot of them, but like I said, join us on our uh, webinar that we'll host in June and it's going to be at a bit of a slower pace.